A new bot is selling your Discord content, not just the metadata. DuckDuckGo has announced some new privacy protecting services. Proton and Standard Notes have joined forces and much more. Welcome to Surveillance Report 174, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news from the past two weeks, which have been super busy, as always happens when we miss a week. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And I'm Henry from TechLore. All right, our promo segment, we still have a Patreon, of course. For $5 a month or more, you get to ask a question in the Q&A segment. For $10 a month or more, you get an extended version of the podcast, which includes more of our personal thoughts, analysis, jokes, banter, all that kind of fun stuff. If you are not concerned about the perks, but you still want an easy way to support us, we have LibrePay, which is more privacy respecting and still has the whole just subscribe and let it run thing. Or if you want the maximum amount of privacy and security, we accept Monero. And we don't see anything about you, but we do thank everyone who is able to financially support us. And thank you for keeping this podcast going. I will keep this brief, but I do have a few PSAs. First of all, we were gone for a while. I'm sure you all noticed. I just wanted to say apologies for that. Thank you for those of us who stuck with us. On that note, number two, we have reworked some of the workflow on the back end. Going forward, podcasts should be much more consistent. Regular episodes like this one should be out on Sunday nights. Q&As should be out on Wednesday nights. Third, on the topic of the Q&A, I think we're going to skip a week so that we can kind of get back on track. So there will be no 173 Q&A. We're just going to pick up with 174. If you are a patron and you feel like you're being cheated, let us know and we will find a way to make it up to you. Fourth, we will be adding Q&A to the Q&As. Whenever we make a change, we have to test things out because sometimes people just need time to get used to it. So sometimes we have to take a while to see if this is a good change or not. And I apologize for those who have been frustrated, but that should hopefully once and for all fix this confusion. And last but not least, I've noticed some of you guys have been leaving stories in the comments. If you have stories to share with us, news at surveillancereport.tech. That is the best way to get stories to us. Otherwise, they get lost in the YouTube comments or we may not see them because YouTube likes to randomly delete stories or comments. That's a whole thing. All right, so our highlight story this week definitely is an interesting one, and it comes from Discord. And Discord is going through some controversy because a spy site is scraping Discord and selling users' messages. So this is happening pretty much all across the board, and it's archiving and tracking users' messages and activity across servers, including what voice channels they join, and then selling access to that data for as little as $5. This tool is called SpyPet, and the service's creator says it scrapes more than 10,000 Discord servers, and besides selling access to anyone with cryptocurrency, is also offering the data for training AI models or to assist law enforcement agencies, according to its website. It claims to be tracking more than 14,000 servers, 600 million users, which is twice the amount of people almost as the US, and includes a database of more than 3 billion messages. After searching for a user, a page displays the servers that they're a part of that SpyPet has visibility into. Any connected accounts such as their GitHub, a table containing their most recent messages, and a log of when they joined or left specific voice channels in a server. Users can also export a target's chats into a CSV file according to their tests. Now, there's no indication that SpyPet has obtained private messages sent between individual Discord users, which is good, but all that other information is still a big deal. A Discord spokesperson said the company's investigating and that Discord is committed to protecting the privacy and data of their users. The SpyPet creators said they have not received any communications or legal threats from Discord itself. And I'm going to just chime in here and just mention how on Techler we made a video about Discord uh, a long time ago and kind of the privacy implications of Discord. And Discord, you know, they're going to say they care about the privacy of their users, but they actually haven't really implemented many privacy respecting technologies that are kind of bare staples. And even companies like Facebook are kind of ahead of Discord in some regards, at least offering end to end encrypted DMs and even end to end encrypted group chats and things of that nature, which Discord has never done. And also, Discord just doesn't make it easy for you to delete your, your data. So there's a lot of things Discord that I, I wish it did to help prevent this issue, at least for people who could do something about it. Continuing the story, at the bottom of the site, a button indicates that people can request removal from SpyPet. And after clipping that, a clip from Spider-Man 2, the 2004 one, in which Jonah Jameson laughs at Peter Parker, automatically plays. You're serious? 
he says. <laughs> now, there is something interesting here, and it's kind of an update. So 404 Media determined that the administrator's email address is linked to an account on Kiwi Farms. When trying to create a new account on Kiwi Farms with the SpyPit administrator's email, the site says it's not possible because that email address is already in use. Something interesting. Also, uh, shame on Kiwi Farms for not thinking ahead on that, because that's kind of something that sites nowadays try not to do, is reveal if the email's registered to the account by giving a, a neutral uh, statement in regards to the email. But interesting stuff nonetheless. All right. I have a lot of thoughts. First of all, I checked how many Discord users are there. This is a summary from Braves AI, but I did see it highlighted in a couple other sources, although I don't know how reliable those sources are. As of 2024, Discord only has 614 million registered users. So every user. And around 560 million active users monthly. So yeah, basically everybody. My first thought is, yeah, you know, like you were saying, Discord is committed to protecting the privacy and data. We saw another bot like this a couple years ago that I'm pretty sure we covered on Surveillance Report that wasn't selling the data, but they were basically joining all the servers recording usernames and they were listing what servers users were in and they weren't charging for it but like anybody could go look at their website and see you know this person is in all these different servers which i think is not a big deal for people who are just you know using it for gaming or something like who cares if you're in like five minecraft servers and a meme server and like a i'm just pulling random games off the top of my head genshin impact and maybe like a streamer like that's fine but remember that discord once you flag them and they decide you need to verify yourself they require a sim number so unless you're going to go out and buy like a new sim card for every discord account you can only have so many discord accounts or join so many servers where i'm going with that is there are a lot of different servers for different things. There's LGBTQ issues, there's political issues, there's um, other not safe for work issues. And if you're in all these multiple servers, that could dox you or that could just be something you don't feel comfortable revealing. I mean, I know I'm preaching the choir here, but the whole point of privacy is you get to choose what you reveal and to who. The reason I mentioned that bot is Discord knew about it and just didn't care. Like they actually replied that it didn't break their terms of service or something like that. So Discord is not committed to your privacy. Yeah, I think the only note I have here to add is it's a little infuriating because I remember just recently, I think a couple months ago, Mastodon was dealing with kind of this weird spam issue and pretty much it was spamming everyone's notifications and it was super obnoxious and Mastodon clearly just isn't, at least at the time, I don't think it's any better, but it's just not built to deal with issues like that very efficiently. And it still required every server admin to have to upgrade and take their own mitigations against this. And the problem here and where this ties into Discord is that whole attack was actually run on a Discord server. That's where they were coordinating. That's where everything happened. Discord didn't do anything against that. Discord has no moderation. There is almost no administrative moderation on Discord. And... It's just clear that, and this is kind of the problem too, is like when you don't have someone who actually sets the rules and sticks to the rules, sometimes people lose privacy as a result of that. When you don't have someone who's actually stepping forward and going, we want to protect users, we want to make sure things are kept safe on the platform, it opens things up like this, where just a person builds a bot and scrapes every user's data because things aren't really built in a secure or private way. And this is actually one of my bigger concerns about something like Matrix. I just feel like that data just being out there and ready to be scooped up, now it is decentralized. I feel like there are a lot more precautions in place for something like Matrix. But I feel like if someone really wanted to scrape up a lot of Matrix data, they probably could, just because there's not many safeguards in place for things like that. Um, so that's kind of a concern that's not exclusive to Discord, I think. I think the saving grace of Matrix is that most people who use Matrix are tech savvy enough to know, like, this is public and you need to keep that in mind. But also if we're trying to get people off Discord to more privacy respecting platforms, that just means they're going to bring those same mentalities over and they may not necessarily know that. So I do agree with you there. And it's, it is a really tricky, like, like how do you prevent that? Because even if you make a room encrypted, as soon as people join it, you know, like this thing we're talking about right here, it says in the article, this bot on Discord was joining servers. It wasn't like they found some kind of exploit where they could just scrape Discord's database on Discord servers. Like they just sent out a bot that was joining all the different servers out there and recording everything that happened. So 
how is that any different than the bot that joins Matrix to map the, the network? And oh, by the way, also while I'm here, I'm going to scrape every message. With that, we'll move into data breaches. There were quite a lot this week, so we're going to try to blow through these as quick as we can. First up, Home Depot confirms a third-party data breach that exposed employee info. For those who don't know, Home Depot is the largest home improvement retailer with more than 2,300 stores in North America and almost half a million employees. A third-party software-as-a-service vendor inadvertently made public a small sample of Home Depot associates' names, work email addresses, and user IDs during a test of their systems. This impacted about 10,000 employees. Indian auto giant Boat but it's actually B-O-A-T with a capital A, says it's investigating suspected customer data breach, and this is their largest audio and wearable brand, and it included full names, phone numbers, email addresses, mailing addresses, and order numbers, impacting about 7.5 million customers. Cyber criminals stole 340,000 social security numbers from government consulting firm. The firm in question was Greylock McKinnon Associates. This data included names, dates of birth, home address, some medical information and health insurance information, and Medicare claim numbers, which included social security numbers. Just as a note of interest, this was disclosed nine months after the breach took place. So, Always remember, do not be reactive. Do not wait until you get the breach notice because it might take a really long time. Always try to be proactive with protecting your data. Cyber criminals claim giant tiger data breach leaking almost 3 million records online. This is a discount store chain that operates over 260 stores and employs 8,000 people across Canada. The breach includes email addresses, names, phone numbers, and physical addresses, and the stolen data in the dump claims the threat actor additionally includes the website activity of Giant Tiger customers. Cisco Duo warns third-party data breach exposed SMS F MFA logs. So Cisco Duo is a multi-factor authentication and single sign-on service used by corporations to provide secure access to internal networks and corporate applications. The data contained in these logs includes an employee's phone number, carrier location data, date, time, and message type. This affected about a thousand accounts. Chipmaker Nexperia confirms breach after ransomware gang leaks data. It's a subsidiary of Chinese company WingTech that operates a semiconductor fabrication plant in Germany and the UK, and they do a lot of chip stuff. The threat actors published images of microscope scans of electronic components, employee passports, NDAs, and various other samples whose authenticity hasn't been confirmed by the chipmaker yet. That's all we know so far. Change Healthcare stolen patient data is leaked by a ransomware gang. So this is the second group to demand a ransomware payment to prevent the release of stolen patient data in two months. Keeping this brief, but just a quick recap. So for those who don't know, who are maybe just joining us, ransomware has ballooned into this whole industry where there's like specializations and there's um, like, I think they even have their own courts to settle disputes. So basically the person who initially gets into your system may not be the same person who actually steals the data. Just again, keeping this real brief. So when change was hacked, the people who stole the data or claimed to be behind it basically pulled an exit scam. They just like took everybody's money and bailed and it like kind of created this whole power vacuum and this whole chaos and everything. So it's kind of unclear, like, is this a group who's capitalizing on that confusion to be like, hey, we we don't actually have your data, but we're going to claim we do. Do maybe multiple parties have the data? This is the second ransomware group to be like, hey, we have your data. You need to pay us. This data contains personal information about patients across different documents, such as billing files, insurance records, and medical information. Some of the files, which TechCrunch did see, also contain contracts and agreements between Change and its partners. Intel broker claims Space Eyes breach targeting U.S. national security data. According to Space Eyes website, it caters exclusively to government agencies and organizations, including the DOJ, DHS, various branches of the U.S. Armed Forces, and crucial intelligence bodies like the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Full names, phone numbers, company names, job descriptions, email addresses, about 27 or 26,000 of them, some password hashes, complete location data, including coordinates and addresses, and more. It also includes tons of non-personal, potentially top-secret documents concerning things like naval records, counter-terrorism efforts, and more. This one comes from Brian Krebs. It says, why CISA is warning CISOs about a breach at 
CSENS or CISENS. I don't actually know how that's pronounced. CISOs, for those who don't know, Chief Information Security Officer. Normally, we don't talk about data breaches that didn't impact individuals, but this one kind of made the rounds and it was kind of a big deal. So quoting Brian Krebs, New York City-based CSENS has had more than a thousand customers across a range of industry verticals, including financial services, telecommunications, healthcare, and higher education, unquote. He didn't directly say why in his article, unless maybe I missed it. But basically, it seems like, long story short, someone gained illicit access to CSense's self-hosted GitLab server, which contained customer tokens and credentials like API keys, things that you would use to like connect remotely. Customers are being urged to reset those access tokens and passwords, of course. I'm assuming from context that this is a big deal because they have a lot of huge clients and this could be a trickle down breach, kind of like move it or solar winds or what's, what's the one a few years ago, like Excellion, I think it was. So we might see more out of this in the coming weeks, or hopefully we won't see anything, but this kind of made, made some big waves. So just putting that on your radar. Cyber criminals are threatening to publish a huge stolen sanctions and financial crimes watch list. So the hackers call themselves Ghoster, and they sell 5.3 million records from the World Check screening database in March and are threatening to publish the data online. This is a database for KYC, or Know Your Customer Checks, allowing companies to determine if customers are high risk or potential criminals, such as people with links to money laundering or who are under government sanctions. A portion of the stolen data which the hackers shared with TechCrunch includes individuals who were sanctioned as earlier as this year. The database contains names, passport numbers, social security numbers, online crypto account identifiers, and bank account numbers, and more. Frontier Communications. They have shut down after a cyber attack. Frontier is a leading U.S. communications provider that provides gigabit internet speeds over a fiber optic network to millions of consumers and businesses across 25 states. Frontier says that the attackers could have accessed some PII data, although it did not disclose if it belonged to customers, employees, or both. So this one's kind of nebulous. We don't know a lot, but it sounds like attackers did have access to data, and if they had the access, they almost certainly took it. We'll keep you updated if we hear more, but yeah, if you are a Frontier customer or employee or both, take appropriate measures. United Nations Agency investigates ransomware attack and data theft. So the UN's Global Development Network works in over 170 countries and territories and relies on donations from UN member states and private sector multilateral organizations to help eradicate poverty and fight inequality and exclusion. Unfortunately, there was this data theft, and it includes a huge amount of confidential information like personal data, accounting data, certificates, employment contracts, confidentiality agreements, invoices, receipts, and more. We made it through the data breaches, and that means it's time for companies. This one's pretty long, and because this is already shaping up to be a long episode, I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. DuckDuckGo has launched Privacy Pro, a three-in-one subscription that features a VPN, personal information removal, and identity theft restoration. So this is $10 a month or $100 a year. It's currently only available in the U.S., but they do want to expand it in the future. They start off the blog post talking about the DuckDuckGo browser and how it protects your privacy. After that, they say, quote, however, there's only so much protection we can provide for free. For example, some protections like securing our users' network connections with a VPN require significantly more bandwidth and other resources. Unquote. So on the topic of a VPN, they say they won't keep logs. So going through each service, they say personal information removal is the first of its kind that works directly from your device. The details you provide during setup are stored on your device and not on remote servers. Remote requests are initiated directly from that device. They also say another thing that makes them different is personal information removal only does the opt-out process once they've confirmed that they have you in their databases. They say unless you become a victim of identity theft and need help, you don't need to provide any information to them and their, their partners. It's waiting for when you need it. The VPN is operated directly by DuckDuckGo and not a third party. It offers up to five devices. It has an automatic kill switch. It's full coverage. It's not just the browser. They currently have servers in the US, Europe, and Canada. They're planning to add more. They are using WireGuard and encrypted DNS, and they are also using their own DNS resolvers. So as far as the personal information removal, they talk about how they purchased the service Removely back in 2022. It rescans sites regularly to minimize the risk of your info appearing. At the moment, you need to use a desktop device like Mac or Windows to set this up, but in the long term, they are hoping to add this to like mobile devices. 
And last but not least, the identity theft restoration, they have powered with a company called Iris, which is powered by Generally, which is, quote, one of the oldest firms specializing in identity theft in the U.S. They are available 24-7 every day of the year. They answer calls within 11 seconds on average, which is pretty impressive. So if your identity gets stolen, you can work with this company. They will ask you a few questions in order to like pr be able to provide the service. They say that once care is established, Iris has several ways to help you get back on track. They can repair your credit after fraudulent activities. They can help replace documents. They offer travel assistance. They can untangle fraudulent medical claims, and they can cover out-of-pocket costs. So this is just a, a heavily, heavily condensed version. There's a lot more details in the article. Our next story is from kind of Google. So Android 15 actually has a few privacy improvements that we'll talk about. So the first one is Wi-Fi Privacy Now has a full page menu with a new send device name toggle. For example, it's common, especially for iPhone users, to give your phone a personalized name, like Henry's iPhone. But by turning it off, send device name, you won't have that problem. Beforehand, if it was Henry's Pixel, now it's just gonna say something random. I don't know exactly what it's replacing it with, but it won't be the phone's name. Next up, uh, Google introduced a set of new privacy protecting features for cell networks. The first toggle, security notifications, is the less strict of the two. Security notifications are pretty much Android will let you know whether you connect to a cell network that either isn't encrypted or records your IMEI and IMSI numbers. One common situation in which this would occur is if a law enforcement agency is using a Stingray device to track nearby cell network usage. The ACLU has some helpful resources explaining how and where Stingrays are used in the US. Now you can go a step further though, and you can also choose to require encryption, protecting against potential surveillance. So that's the higher level uh, option. And also, I just briefly read this, we're not, maybe we'll find a story for this, but I did see that Android 15 is also rumored, most likely going to include some pretty much Samsung feature where it's gonna have like a hidden app section. So you can hide apps from being easily accessible, more of a surface level feature, but still something useful for maybe like a domestic abuse situation. So good stuff on Android 15. This next story also comes from Google and it's quick. Google One is shutting down its VPN feature later this year. So for the three people who are using it and watching this, Google didn't say when the service will stop working completely, but they said that it's discontinuing the feature. And I quote, because people simply weren't using it. So instead of trying to drum up interest, it's redirecting resources to support other more in-demand one features. However, you will still be able to use the free VPN that comes with Pixel devices even after one's shutdown through the settings app on Pixel 7 devices and newer models. iOS 18 AI will be on device. This will work entirely on device and in practice, these AI features would be able to function without any internet connection or any form of cloud-based processing. While more advanced features will ultimately require an internet Internet connection, basic text analysis and response generation features should be available offline. And they did discuss licensing Google and OpenAI's technology for use in iOS 18 rather than developing their own LLM online. So our next story is still from Apple, but it has to do with sideloading and alternate app stores. The next three stories actually all have to do with sideloading and alternate app stores in the EU and stuff. So the headline for this next one says, Apple will soon let the EU download apps through its website, not just the app store. We definitely covered this one in the past. This is just a quick update to say that it is actually rolling out now. For those who are just joining us, Basically, you can now download some apps if the developers choose to allow it. You can now download them directly from the website. I'm assuming kind of like an APK on Android. However, there's a bunch of caveats because this is all malicious compliance and Apple is trying to disincentivize developers. That's in the article. On the other hand, though, we do have our first alternative app marketplace, which is called Alt Store Pal, P-A-L. So this is an open source app that is designed to distribute apps from independent developers. So it's kind of like F-Droid. I don't think the apps in the App Store have to be open source, but the App Store itself is. Currently at launch, it features two apps, including Testu's Delta Game Emulator and Clipboard Manager app Clip. Test, I'm probably saying that wrong. Testa, Testu? said that once Outstore Pal is, quote, running smoothly, 
Third-party app developers will be able to submit their apps for distribution outside of the App Store. The marketplace is designed to be decentralized with no directory, so developers will need to self-promote their apps and direct users to their websites to install an app through Alt Store. The third story involving all of this stuff comes from Apple. The headline says Apple pulls WhatsApp and threads from China App Store after Beijing order. Quoting the article, Apple said on Friday that it had removed Meta Platform's WhatsApp and threads from its App Store in China after being ordered to do so by the government, the Chinese government, which cited national security concerns. Telegram and Signal, two other foreign messaging apps, were also removed from the store on Friday, according to app tracking firms. The removal of the four apps suggests growing intolerance on the part of China's central government toward at least some foreign online messaging services that fall outside of its control. It also signals less leeway for Apple in China. The article goes on to note, that said, other meta apps, including Facebook, Instagram, and Messenger, remained available to download, and other popular apps like YouTube and X were also available. Meta to close threads in Turkey to comply with injunction prohibiting data sharing with Instagram. So Meta said Monday it plans to temporarily shutter threads in Turkey from April 29th in response to this injunction. The Turkish Competition Authority, TCA, noted on March 18th that its investigation found that Meta is abusing its dominant market position by combining the data of users who create threads profiles with that of their Instagram account without giving users the choice to opt in. Twitter's clumsy pivot to x.com is a gift to Fishers. I think this one also came from Brian Krebs, if I remember correctly. But basically, on April 9th, Twitter slash X began to automatically modify links that mention twitter.com to read x.com because they are still relatively unsuccessfully trying to get everyone to call it X instead of Twitter. Over the past 48 hours, dozens of new domain names have been registered that demonstrate how this change could be used to craft convincing phishing links. So, for example, fedetwitter.com, F-E-D-E twitter.com, until very recently rendered as fedex.com in tweets. A search at domaintools.com shows at least 60 domain names have been registered over the past two days for domains ending in twitter.com. Although research so far shows the majority of these domains have been registered quote-unquote defensively by private individuals to prevent the domains from being purchased by scammers. Quick update, it does appear that since publication, Twitter slash X has corrected this mistake and it no longer does this. Open Table is an anonymous review site for restaurant reservations or something like that. And pretty much a big basis of how this works is that you can leave anonymous reviews. Open Table announced that they will be revealing all the posts that were anonymous and including a name and profile photo of those users. And of course, people said this is a breach of privacy. It's not good. It violates everything the platform stands for. And the update to the story is Open Table will not be doing that. However, they will be doing that for all future posts. So if you make any posts from here on out, this will be the new policy going forward, which is they will still show your information. But if you did leave posts beforehand, you're still fine. But uh, I'm guessing most people are going to flock from this platform. And in my eyes, that's probably the death of the platform, at least for that use case. Our last company story is pretty self-explanatory. It says Roku makes two-factor authentication mandatory for all after nearly 600,000 accounts pwned. I don't think we covered this last time, but there was like a credential stuffing going on with Roku accounts. So since that was such a short story, I will go ahead and lead us into research next. Hackable Intel and Lenovo hardware that went undetected for five years won't ever be fixed. So security researchers have confirmed that this affects Intel, Lenovo, and Supermicro shipping server hardware that contained a vulnerability that can be exploited to reveal security critical information. The researchers also went on to warn that any hardware that incorporates certain generations of baseboard management controllers made by AMI or AETN are also affected. So for those who don't know, BMCs are tiny computers soldered into the motherboard of servers that allow cloud centers and sometimes their customers to streamline the remote management of vast fleets of servers. They enable administrators to remotely reinstall operating systems, install and uninstall apps, and control just about every other aspect of the system, even when it's turned on off. For years, BMCs from multiple manufacturers have incorporated vulnerable versions of open source software known as Light TPD. Light TPD is a fast, lightweight web server that's compatible with various hardware and software platforms. In 2018, developers released a new version that fixed, quote, various use-after-free scenarios. 
a vague reference to a class of vulnerability that can be remotely exploitable to tamper with security-sensitive memory functions of the affected software. Despite the description, they never used the word vulnerability, and there was never a CVE assigned to the vulnerability. BMC makers were using affected versions when the vulnerability was fixed and continued doing so for years. Server manufacturers, in turn, continued putting the vulnerable BMCs into their hardware over the same multi-year period. Hardware sold by Intel as recently as last year is affected. The researchers noted that Intel and Lenovo both have no plans to release fixes because they no longer support the affected hardware. Affected products from Supermicro are still supported, although they didn't say if they were planning to push out any updates. And then just for those who wonder what is the risk of this, a potential attacker can exploit this vulnerability in order to read memory of the web server process. This may lead to sensitive data exfiltration, such as memory addresses, which can be used to bypass security mechanisms such as the ASLR. So this is kind of technical and this does require chaining multiple vulnerabilities together, or at least like doing more from there. Like this will get you access to the server, but you still have to do more to get more data from the server from there, but it's still pretty bad. And advisories are available in the article as well as more technical information. I tried to really condense this. So the title of this article is 96% of US hospital websites share visitor info with Meta, Google, and data brokers. This is done by the academics at the University of Pennsylvania, and they analyzed a nationally representative sample of 100 non-federal acute care hospitals, essentially traditional hospitals with emergency departments, and their findings were again 96% transmitted user data to third parties. Additionally, not all of those websites even had a privacy policy, and of the 71% that did, 56% disclosed specific third-party companies that could receive user information. Now, to find the trackers on websites, the team checked out each hospital's homepage on January 26th using Web X-Ray, an open source tool detecting third-party HTTP requests, and then matching them to the organizations receiving the data. They also recorded the number of third-party cookies per page. One name in particular stood out in terms of who was receiving websites visitors' information. In every study they did in any part of the health system, Google, whose parent company is Alphabet, is on nearly every page, including hospitals. From there, it tends to decline. Meta was on a little over half of hospital web pages, and the Meta Pixel is notable because it seems to be one of the grabbier entities out there in terms of tracking, as Meta likes to do. In addition, between 20 and 30% of the hospitals share data with Adobe. Others include telecom and digital marketing companies like the Trade Desk and Verizon, plus tech giants Oracle, Microsoft, and Amazon. Then there's also analytics firms including Hotjar and data brokers like Axiom. Axiom. Oh, oh, Axiom. That makes sense. Two-thirds of hospital websites had some kind of data transfer to a third-party domain that they couldn't even identify. Of the 71 hospital websites' privacy policies that the team found, 69 addressed the type of user information that was collected. The most common were IP addresses, web browser name and version were next, page, pages visited on the website was next, and then the website from which the users arrived from is also there, too, at 73%. Only 56% of these policies identified the third-party companies receiving user information. Let's move into politics. So unfortunately, we're going to start off with some bad news. The U.S. House has voted to extend and expand a major U.S. spy program. So this is the infamous Section 702, which gives the NSA permission to request information regarding, quote, what is it, any tangible thing, unquote, related to national security. So this passed in the House by a 273 to 147 vote. The Senate has yet to pass its own bill. And I think they're talking about a separate bill there, but I'm not quite positive. So Section 702 permits the U.S. government to wiretap communications between Americans and foreigners overseas. Hundreds of millions of calls, texts, and emails are intercepted by government spies, each with the quote-unquote compelled assistance of U.S. communications providers. The House bill also dramatically expands the statutory definition for communication service providers, something that experts have publicly warned against. Quoting Senator Ron Wyden, anti-reformers not only are refusing common sense reforms to FISA, they're pushing for a major expansion of warrantless spying on Americans. Their amendment would force your cable guy to be a government spy and assist in monitoring Americans' communications without a warrant, unquote. Future Nate here. So we recorded this Friday evening and then Saturday morning in my news feed. We have this new article from TechCrunch that says lawmakers vote to reauthorize U.S. spying law that critics say expands government surveillance. 
Basically, the update here is that this has now passed the Senate. So this passed on a 60-34 vote. This will now go to President Biden's desk, where the article says, quote, it will almost certainly pass into law, unquote. Unfortunately, also, that amendment we just talked about that expanded the scope of the bill also failed to be removed. It will now expire at the end of 2026, setting up a similar legislative showdown midway through the next U.S. administration. The House passes a bill requiring a warrant to purchase data from third parties. So this is dubbed the Fourth Amendment is not for sale. And it requires law enforcement and other government entities to get a warrant before buying information from third party data brokers who purchase information from applications indirectly. Senior administration officials said the measure would blind U.S. intelligence outfits from getting information easily purchased by foreign intelligence operations. I'll keep this next one quick. The SEC targets its own staff's texting and nixes WhatsApp on work phones. So the Security Exchange Commission has blocked third-party messaging apps and texts from employees' work mobile phones, bringing its own practices closer to the standards it is enforcing for the industry. This actually happened because they were investigating someone else, like a, a bank or some kind of financial institution, and basically they couldn't pull any records to investigate because the company used Signal. I think they said Signal, but like apps like Signal to protect communications. And because Signal is end-to-end -end encrypted, they couldn't subpoena any text messages. They couldn't get any records to really do their investigation. And they basically said, like, you can't do that because it makes you immune to investigation. Northrop Grumman working with Musk's SpaceX on U.S. spy satellite program. You know, I would just read this article. There's not much information here that you can't gather from the, the title. They're just starting to implement this and they're starting to talk about how they can pretty much use SpaceX to help capture some images and use it for intelligence and track military movements, things like that. Not something that I don't think any of us were not expecting, but we're actually starting to see signs of this now. So check out the article for more details. And really quick, we've talked about this a lot on both the new oil and on tech lore, but we talk about kind of the limitations of biometrics as well as the strengths of biometrics and also the limitations of passphrases and the strengths. And here is where we typically talk about the faults of biometrics, which is cops can force suspect to unlock phone with thumbprint, U.S. court rules, because again, the Fifth Amendment protection against self-incrimination does not prohibit police officers from forcing a suspect to unlock their phone, but it would for a password. So there's just one more case where, again, the thumbprint doesn't work as well if you're actually arrested and they need to force you to unlock a cell phone. Our next story comes from the U.S. state of Colorado, where big tech cannot hoard your brainwave data for ad targeting. So on Wednesday, Colorado expanded the scope of its privacy law, initially designed to protect biometric data such as fingerprints or face images, and it will become the first in the nation to also shield sensitive neural data. So the New York Times reported that neural data is increasingly being collected and sold nationwide. Investments in neurotech leapt by 60% globally between 2019 and 2020, which was $30 billion in 2021. For instance, they talk about in 2023, Meta demoed a wristband with neural interface used to control its smart glasses. In January, Elon Musk announced that Neuralink implanted its first brain chip in a human. Last month, Apple is reportedly working on technology that could turn the Apple Vision Pro into a brainwave reader to improve mental health, assist with training and workouts, and help with mindfulness. So the last little bit here, it says, Colorado's law requires tech companies to gain consent to collect neural data and be more transparent about how the data is used. Additionally, it must be easy for people to access, delete, or correct any data, either on its own or in combination with other personal data for identification purposes. Companies must also provide paths for users to opt out of the sale of their data or the use of their data in targeted advertising. The article said tracking a person's brain activity in real time could give big tech the ultimate tool for targeted ads by theoretically offering a more reliable, precise, and personalized representation of an ad's effectiveness. EU privacy body adopts view on Meta's controversial consent or pay tactic. So they've decided that large platforms like Facebook and Instagram cannot force a binary pay or consent choice on users. The decision looks set to leave Meta with no option but to reform its business model to comply with EU law, which would mean giving users in the block the ability to deny its tracking. 
Shoplifting crackdown to include 55 million pounds for facial recognition tools in England and Wales. So the government is investing more than 55 million pounds in expanding facial recognition systems, including vans that will scan crowded high streets as part of a renewed crackdown on shoplifting. The scheme was announced alongside plans for tougher punishments on serial or abusive shoplifters, including being forced to wear a tag to ensure that they do not revisit the scene of their crime. The new law under which perpetrators could be sent to prison for up to six Six months and receive unlimited fines will be introduced via an amendment to the criminal justice bill that is working its way through parliament and the change could happen as early as the summer so if you are in the uk please go check out the article get more information and call your elected officials because this is pretty wild also in the uk e-visas are rolling out starting today at the time that they wrote the article, not at the time of us recording, for millions, no more physical immigration cards. So millions living in the UK will receive email invites to sign up for an e-visa account that will replace their physical immigration documents like biometric residence permits. These invites will be issued in phases, and although initially by invite only, the process will open to all BRP holders in summer of 2024. Hackers linked to Russia's military claim credit for sabotaging U.S. water utilities. So since the beginning of the year, a hacktivist group known as the Cyber Army of Russia, or also known as the Cyber Army of Russia Reborn, has taken credit on at least three occasions for hacking operations that targeted U.S. and European water and hydroelectric utilities. In each case, the hackers have posted videos to the social media platform Telegram that shows the screen recordings of their chaotic manipulations of so-called human-machine interfaces. The apparent victims of the hacking include multiple U.S. water utilities in Texas, one Polish wastewater treatment plant, and allegedly, or reportedly, a French water mill, which the attackers claim was a French hydroelectric dam. It is unclear exactly how much disruption or damage the hackers may have managed against any of those facilities. So the only one they are sure is successful is the one in Texas. Apparently, they made a water treatment tank overflow. It doesn't seem like these guys really know what they're doing. They were just kind of clicking random buttons. A news report published by cybersecurity firm Mandiant draws a link between the hacker group and Sandworm, which has been identified for years as Unit 74455 of Russia's GRU Military Intelligence Agency. This is a really quick story here, and it's that the Dutch privacy watchdog recommends government organizations stop using Facebook. It's unclear what happens with personal data of users of the government's Facebook pages is what the Dutch Privacy Watchdog said. Let's go into the FOSS section, free and open source news, to more exciting news, which is that Proton and Standard Notes are joining forces. So Standard Notes will remain open source, freely available and fully supported, prices are not changing, and if you have a current subscription to Standard Notes, it will continue to be honored. In the coming months, they will find ways to make Standard Notes more easily accessible to the Proton community. This way, in addition to protecting your email, calendar, files, passwords, and online activity, you can also protect your notes. Google search is a problem. How Google is crushing Tuda. So I'm sharing this more kind of as a PSA, but according to Tuda Nota, or, you know, formerly Tuda Nota, according to Tuda, a few weeks ago, Google stopped showing the Tuda website for search terms like encrypted email or secure email. Even when people search for Tuda login on Google in Germany, they do not see the website as a first result, but the Android app on Google Play on other search engines such as DuckDuckGo, Yahoo, or Bing, there is no issue. The website only comes up as the first search result. So while this is clearly an issue with Google only, it has severe implications for our business. Just to clarify, they did reach out to Google multiple times and Google has not responded to them. So they're not getting any help. That's why they made this blog post. Google is just ignoring them. Super quick story here, Firefox Nightly expands to Linux on ARM64. So if you're using ARM64 on Linux, you now have native support for Firefox, at least in a nightly version. You can go ahead and test that out and expect bugs and report those bugs if you do. And our last FOSS story comes from Matrix, who is announcing a 2024 governing board election. This is the first one ever. They will start with a one-week nomination period that opens Saturday, April 20th. So God willing, by the time this is published, it opened yesterday. It will close on Friday the 26th, anywhere on Earth 
time. They will be seating candidates for all constituency groups in the first election starting in 2025. They will run elections for half of the groups. So they're um, kind of like overlapping and maintaining consistency. They go into a lot of detail in the blog post about like what is a constituency group. So I'm not going to rehash that here, but it is in the blog post for those who are interested. If you have donated at least $60 USD to the foundation since April 20th, then you are eligible to nominate and vote. So if you are invested in Matrix and you want to have a say in these kind of things, be sure to check out the blog post for more information. And with that, we're going to go into the misfits. So the price of zero-day exploits rises as companies harden products against hackers. So tools that allow government hackers to break into iPhones and Android phones, and also things like Chrome, Safari, and other popular apps like Messengers are now worth millions of dollars, and their price has multiplied in the last few years as the products are getting harder and harder to hack. People in and around the zero-day industry agree that the job of exploiting vulnerabilities is getting harder. Stagno explained that in 2015 or 2016, it was possible for only one researcher to find one or more zero days and develop them into a fully fledged exploit targeting iPhones or Androids. Now he said this thing is almost impossible as it requires a team of several researchers, which also causes prices to go up. And our last story this week. For the sports fans in the audience, bad news. Four baseball teams will now let ticket holders enter using AI-powered facial authentication. The Giants are now using MLB's new Go Ahead Entry program, which intends to cut down on wait times for fans entering games. The pitch is simple. Take a selfie through the MLB Ballpark app, which already has your tickets on it, upload the selfie, and once you're approved, breeze through the ticketing lines and into the ballpark. Fans will barely have to slow down at the entrance gate on their way to their seats. The Philadelphia Phillies were the MLB's test team back in 2023. They are now joined by the Giants, Nationals, and Astros in 2024. The MLB won't say if it's saving or storing pictures of faces in database and clearly would really like you to not call this technology facial recognition. Privacy advocates have pointed out that the creep of facial recognition technology may be something to be wary of. The article does go on to note that this technology is currently still completely optional. That's all we had for this week. So there is a bot out there selling your Discord content. Be mindful of what you post online. DuckDuckGo has announced a suite of new privacy protecting services. Very interesting stuff. Proton and Standard Notes have joined forces. We'll wait to see what that brings and much, much more. If you want to help keep this podcast free for everyone, we have a Patreon. For $5 a month or more, you can ask us a question, which should be coming out this Wednesday midweek. For $10 a month or more, this recording was definitely the longest we've ever done, so there will definitely be plenty of analysis, banter, thoughts, and opinions and you can get that for $10 a month or more. If you don't care about the perks, but you just want an easy way to support us, Libra Pay is recurring and is much more privacy respecting. And of course, for the maximum amount of privacy and security, we have Monero. And we don't see anything about you, but we do appreciate your support. And of course, we always appreciate liking, subscribing, commenting, sharing, pretty much anything you can do to help the algorithm recognize that this is content people want to see. And we appreciate you guys for supporting us in that way. So thank you for listening. And we're glad that you guys are interested in protecting your privacy and security. Thank you guys for being along on this journey with us. And we will be back next week with some more privacy and security news for you.